Skill to and very good evening, everyone. Welcome back once again to MSBS Weekly Guided Meditation by Prago. Today is the 12th of September 2023. We would like to extend a great welcome to all new viewers to this channel. It is certainly good to see all of you healthy once again on this online platform. We are very grateful to have with us Bante Adi Balo, popularly known as Prago. Bante had his Biko ordination into the Terada tradition of Thai Demisek at Santi Forest Monastery in Johor in 2008. This week, we will be continuing on the topic of Satcha Vibhanga Sutta. Bante will be leading the homage to the Buddha and taking a five precept for Buddhists. Now, let us compose our mind, put our palms together, and welcome Bante. Okay, thank you, Terence. <clears throat> so we start off with uh, paying respects to the Buddha by giving three bows. First bow, second bow, third bow. <clears throat> now the uh, opening chant and the homage. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Three refuges Bhutang Saranang Gachami Tamang Saranang Gachami Sankang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Bhutang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Sankhang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Sankhang Saranang Gachami And the five precepts Panati Pata Viramadi Sikha Padang Samadhyami Adina Dana Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Kami Sumicha Chara Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Musawada Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Sura me raya maja pama datana vera mani sikha padang samadhi yami sadhu 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 okay and uh, good evening to everyone again i think tonight uh, we are on with the third lesson and yeah? third lesson so we've covered uh, all this uh, until yeah I think we're going to start on right speech so we've talked about uh, introducing the Noble Eightfold Path so we covered the right understanding right thought basically covered what's the five clinging aggregates what kind of thoughts we need to do uh, to overcome right okay um, <clears throat> And now we're back to right speech. Okay, so <coughs> in order to have right speech, eh, you need to have the first two also. <coughs> yeah, you need to have the right 
understanding right thought. Yeah, because if a person <clears throat> do not have right intention, do not have right thought, then uh, we are basically parroting. We can be a parrot. We say something, but we don't mean it. Eh? So, okay, so I'm just going to briefly read through this uh, definition of right speech. Yeah, first one, abstaining from lying. That means uh, don't tell lies, be honest, I think quite straightforward. Um, <clears throat> so this one again depends on interpretation. Um, ideally, it would be good to be strict with the precepts. Some people say they are, oh, okay, we can tell white lies. <laughs> so uh, some people have certain gray areas. Uh, ideally, you should try to uh, tell the truth. So this way one can train in wisdom. When you are cornered in a situation uh, frequently and you need to speak the truth, then uh, you're training actually your wisdom how to go about it, how to overcome this situation. So this is, uh, again, it's a training rule, a kind of uh, tool to train the mind. Eh? Okay, then the next one, uh, from divisive speech. So divisive speech is basically to break up people, break up communities. You say one thing to this person, you go to another person and say the bad thing of the previous person. So this is uh, divisive speech. Eh? Okay, um, then the next one from abusive speech. Yeah, so abusive speech is the harsh language, uh, vulgar words, anything that's uh, rough, harsh, uh, intent on harming intent on hurting so that is uh, abusive speech and the last one uh, abstain from this idle chatter right so idle chatter is basically saying anything that is uh, non-beneficial uh, not meaningful basically it can be factual actually eh? it can be factual stuff like I think the previous uh, lesson Roy was asking uh, you know if a person want to socialize right so at least if a person socialize there's intention to get to know the other person so whatever conversation you make if the intention is clear then uh, it doesn't constitute idle chatter so idle chatter means a uh, useless kind of conversation anything that is aimless and uh, not meaningful so like i gave an example previously uh, I can mention the grass is green, the earth is round, the sun is round. Now I can say a lot of factual stuff, but uh, not relevant. Yeah, not relevant to uh, this class, not relevant to this. Uh, the example is relevant, but I mean, if I were to, to use that in every conversation, then I think it's uh, uh, people will walk away from me. Yeah? So uh, there is like, a, how do you call it, a limit. You know, there is a limit to our so-called um, topic, the content. We shouldn't be like saying anything under the sun unnecessarily. So there is like, uh, we need to narrow down. Eh? So these are the four right speeches. So when I, earlier on I mentioned you need to have the right understanding and right thought. If, <coughs> sorry. If a person do not have right thought, <coughs> they can say anything without the intention of training uh, one good example would be uh, maybe a coma patient coma patient from hospital yeah so they cannot speak right so they are on life support uh, so if you give them these precepts or give them thousands of precepts they have no issues they won't break any of the precepts Right, they can't even speak, so they won't commit this uh, this lying. They won't have divisive speech. They don't have abusive speech. They don't have idle chatter, and whatever precept you give them, they have no issues. So, but that's not a point, right? So, in order to train this right speech, <coughs> you need to have this right thought. The intention must be there. Yeah, you need to have thoughts of non greed, thoughts of non anger. So a person, uh, maybe in customer service, yeah, in the customer line, they can put on a smile, they can, uh, you know, based on the protocol, uh, being professional, they need to say pleasant things to the customers, 
even the customers can be very demanding but at the back of the mind they can be cursing and swearing at the customer eh? so that is not the true right speech so at the surface level yes right speech to a certain extent but to practice right speech fully you need to link with the right understanding and right thought eh? so the noble eightfold path is a package it's a wheel eh? it's uh, all interconnected right so uh, if a person really trains right speech you also train your right intention you need to think before you speak you need to think carefully before you speak so it is very important to have uh, you know, all this eightfold path uh, i mean mindful of this noble eightfold path okay um any issues at the moment from anyone before i move on no uh, everyone okay then uh, move on to the next uh okay so the next one is right action so i'm going to read out uh, abstain from taking life from stealing from sexual misconduct this is called right action okay so there are three things um <clears throat> so the first one pretty obvious uh, do not kill uh main main thing is first is human beings and followed by other creatures so there's like severity of the killing so killing of humans is more serious followed by animals and then you know insects and so on so ideally we try not to take any life at all try not to kill not to harm any sentient beings any beings that's alive we uh, try not to harm them right so this is the precept to practice this harmlessness so earlier on we have this uh, right thought one of the definition is thoughts of harmlessness thoughts of harmlessness eh? and uh, when a person have this right thought then it will carry out in their action right uh, the person will be more compassionate be more considerate they will not uh, harm even an insect right so that is uh, the first one and the second one from stealing so stealing is basically uh, to uh, reduce greed mainly so a person when they see something that's nice something they wish to possess but it doesn't belong to you and you take it so that is stealing yeah so we abstain from stealing and the third one from sexual misconduct so the sexual misconduct uh, basically is to be faithful to one's spouse faithful to one's partner and if a person <coughs> Uh, either they are single or they are engaged they shouldn't create another relationship with another person who is already engaged yeah, with another partner so that is uh, part of sexual misconduct and also there's also I think there's an age kind of a requirement although not specifically mentioned what's the age um, but it's mentioned as long as the person is still under the protection of the parent or the guardian then the person is still uh, not fit for these uh, sexual relations right? so it is uh, at least in the sutta definition so probably if we go along the society's law there should be like a certain legal age so we just uh, follow the how do you call it the current context yeah depending on your society you're in um <clears throat> or any kind of um, sexual activity that can land you in jail or is against the laws of the country then one shouldn't uh, do it right? so like maybe previously i think previously in singapore there's this uh, there's this penal code the 377a thing got to do with the lgbt you know i think the sex between gay men is like forbidden so i think the singapore government has lifted this ban All right so before that um uh you know, based on this definition of this sexual misconduct in the buddhist terminology uh it's kind of like against the law although the singapore government sort of like don't pursue it like actively right so but now they lifted this um uh, so-called so -called penal code this law uh, so yeah so there's no issues with the gay men right so this is the sexual misconduct part um, 
So that's for lay persons. So if a person would observe eight precepts, eight precepts and higher, that means totally no sexual activity. Yeah, no sexual activity. That means not even uh, getting into a relationship with anybody. Right? So uh, for the monastic code, uh, even more. Yeah? Not to even flirt, not to uh, uh, get close, not to sit next to a uh, person of the opposite gender in the enclosed room and so on and so forth. So there are many rules. Okay, um, any questions for this point? No? Okay. Pretty straightforward. Huh? Then we move on. Okay, right livelihood. There is a case where a disciple of the Noble Ones, aban having abandoned dishonest livelihood, keeps his life going with right livelihood. And this is called right livelihood. So this is very like general, yeah. Anything that's honest doesn't harm anybody, then that's okay. <clears throat> so for a layperson, at least in the Buddha's time, there are five kind of traits uh, that the Buddha sort of discouraged. First one is the trading of weapons. And number one, trading of weapons. So try not to go into this trade. Excuse me. Secondly, trading in living beings. Trading in living beings. It right? can be human trafficking, animal trafficking, whatever. As long as they're still alive and you're trading them, so that is, uh, we avoid this uh, kind of trade. And the third one, trading in meat. Very interesting, uh, trading in meat. So... Uh, Maybe indirectly the Buddha was promoting like uh, vegetarianism, eh? but uh, not in a direct way. So avoid trading in meat. So that's the third kind of trade. Uh, the fourth one, trading in these uh, poisons, anything that can kill, any kind of uh, thing you inhale or put in your mouth or apply on the skin can kill can harm or kill, then that's a poison, right? So we avoid that kind of trade in such uh, uh, chemicals or poisons. Uh, and the last one, trading in uh, alcohol, trading in alcohol, right? So because alcohol is, you know, gives a person, makes a person heedless and they'll kind of break their precepts if they're not mindful. Uh, so interestingly, in the uh, model kind of a definition of right action, they did not include drinking of alcohol. Yeah, so some people say, hey, it's not part of right action, well, so we can <laughs> drink alcohol. Eh? But uh, no, it, because it's considered a vice. Likewise, gambling is a vice, a lot of things is a vice. Uh, so it's mentioned here uh, in the right livelihood, at least define the right livelihood, not the trade in alcohol. All right, uh, so that's for lay person. So for monastics, there are even more, uh, more of the livelihood. Can't do like fortune telling, palm reading, prediction, and so on. Yeah? So there's uh, more things for monastics. So basically anyone that is uh, uh, serious with the practice, uh, they can also kind of follow some of that uh, protocols, you know, not to engage in uh, kind of livelihood that doesn't lead you to the truth or lead you to something meaningful. Eh? Okay, so that is uh, for a layperson and uh, I mean that's distinguished between a layperson and the monastic. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Is it too vague? You want to ask anything? Okay, if not, I move on. Sorry, Pante, I have a question. Okay. Um, about this livelihood thing, um, so if we follow this, we're running a restaurant that involves selling alcohol, uh, a form of violation, um, does that consider a trade with alcoholic drinks? Yeah, so in a way you need to buy and sell, right? You buy it, you need to purchase alcohol to uh, sell to the clients or to your diners. So uh, we try to avoid that. So 
if a person is a practicing Buddhist, the, the owner of the restaurant is a practicing Buddhist, they can remove the alcohol or the, the live kind of meat, you know, live kind of uh, animals from the menu. Yeah. Mm. The other question is, uh, let's say doctor using antibiotic and that's to kill bacteria. <laughs> Mm. Is, um, how do we view that in terms of uh, yeah because in the very good question and because in the ancient days there isn't mention about <clears throat> or rather openly mentioned about bacteria yeah there isn't like open uh, kind of uh, mention about um, bacteria uh, growth and uh, we shouldn't take any kind of medication to heal the wound and stuff like that. So even in the monastic rules, uh, the Vinaya rules, there are like uh, probably thousands of rules, thousands of protocols, and uh, one whole segment dealing with illnesses. So uh, interestingly, the Buddha allow us to take certain kind of herbs or medication to recover, right? So that would include uh, you no know, killing of the bacteria and viruses right if you take something uh, the body will you know build up the immune system and it will kill this uh, bacteria and viruses so uh, so in a way that is not like intentionally want to kill this uh, bacteria the intention is to heal yeah to heal yourself yeah and also probably uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think a lot of the medication, like there are a lot, lot of spices and whatever not kind of uh, antiseptic uh, stuff, uh, no, which you know, may kill these uh, viruses in the past, uh, bacteria and viruses in the past. So we sort of uh, don't really include them. Yeah. So part of the uh, preset of... Uh, or the breaking of the precept of killing, uh, you need to be able to perceive that being. If it is just an imagination, oh, imagine there's a bacteria, imagine there's a virus, you cannot really see that bacteria or virus. It's just a concept, then uh, uh, no, it doesn't count. Yeah. Ah, yes, Roy. Hi, Monday. Hi, Monday. Monday. Monday got a question about um, food and then you just not talking about it mm. so uh, the one, one you say one of the one livelihood is not to trade in animals mm. so nowadays if you um, i'm not too sure there are some people say you sell grown chicken i'm not i'm not too sure if this was uh is come to your awareness so they're using cell to create chicken and as in chicken meat like, by the way mm -hmm. for singapore i think they try to create chicken nuggets using cell so for mm -hmm. that, right, we um, is that okay to? I mean, I'm not saying I will go into it, but if let's say any Buddhist will want to venture into that industrial industry itself or this particular, mm -hmm. is it fine? Because in a certain sense, you didn't kill the chicken to get the meat, but at the same time, is they using the cell to grow the meat mm -hmm. itself? So what is the Buddha's point of view, or even as per the suttas, or even what's your point of view in this case? Yeah, probably in the past there isn't such technology, so this uh, isn't really being uh, sort of addressed. So, but if you take the the spirit of the the precepts or the spirit of this lively, right livelihood and uh, about on non killing, then there's no killing, right? <clears throat> yeah. So you're just taking the cell. Uh, maybe the chicken may be still alive, and you take uh, the cell of that. Uh, chicken and start to grow grow the meat and so on so i think there's no killing involved yeah but uh, whoever is investing in that uh, uh, business need to really check the science behind this uh, uh, technology yeah? whether uh, there's any other kind of harmful effects or whether the client is really got any problem or not yeah so this one uh, really need some uh, research lah. Uh, that Monday, got one more question. Sorry. So to follow up the question itself, right? So if let's say 
let's say that the science proven is all so for what we call is um we didn't really do any killing of animal then in this case are we able to offer to sangha members in this case as dana yeah yeah um for sangha members because we uh don't really choose whatever you give us we just take so we only have the three impure meats that we kind of reject so the three impure meats if uh, we see hear or suspect that the meat is purposely killed for us purposely killed for us then we do not take so in a way only the monastics are sort of like trying to be not part of the food chain yeah the monastics are trying to be away staying away of the food chain um, <clears throat> so whatever we, we receive is actually a portion of your meal that means uh, the meal you prepare is for your family and then uh, you just out of kindness out of com uh, generosity you offer a portion to the sangha yeah so that's the idea so that's why we can take you know whatever kind of meat you give us uh, it's more or less okay but i think in the later kind of uh, commentarial traditions they will include 10 other kinds of meat uh, that we cannot eat mostly like the exotic kind of meats uh, but I think generally most of the meat in the local market should be okay. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, no problem. Okay, anyone else? Okay, if not, uh, then we move on to the next um, <clears throat> of the Eightfold Path. Okay, so from right speech, right action and right livelihood so these three constitute the uh, morality aspect of the noble eightfold path so now we are going to the last three uh last three uh, sort of eightfold path that's the uh, segment of concentration or samadhi mental cultivation eh? this mental development uh so some would call it uh, bhavana also yeah but uh, in this case samadhi um so there's right effort right mindfulness and right concentration so uh, we start off with right effort so there is the case where a monk or any practitioner generates desire endeavors arouses persistence upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the non-arising of evil and skillful qualities that have not yet arisen all right so this is the first right effort that means do not let uh, evil, unskillful qualities arise. So probably I will emphasize the word unskillful. <clears throat> because evil, I think, quite obvious, right? If you want to kill, no one to steal. So that is very straightforward, kind of evil. But you talk about unskillful, things like we let the mind daydream, lah. I daydream not harmful, right? <laughs> I never harm anybody, right? right? so uh but that itself is unskillful yeah, as long anything that can uh, promote the uh, habit of greed and hatred then that will be unskillful yeah so you're feeding this greed and hatred um, so we try to uh, <clears throat> not let it arise yeah so that's the first right effort second right effort will be abandoning of evil unskillful qualities that have a reason All right so this one is uh, if it has a reason then you try to overcome it try to abandon it All right so the first two right efforts has to do with evil states of mind or unskillful states of mind All right so the first one would be if it hasn't arise don't let it arise and the second one is if it has a reason then you try to abandon it so that's the first two and the next two has to do with positive huh? wholesome or skillful qualities all right um so the third one will be arising of skillful qualities that have not yet arisen so if a person do not have good virtues good qualities things like maybe loving kindness compassion or whatever kind of good qualities you think you want to develop then please go and develop them yeah so this is the third right effort and the fourth one is to maintain if you already have that skillful 
quality, that wholesome quality. Then you maintain, uh, increase, and develop yeah, until you perfect them. So that is the fourth right effort. So total, these are the four right efforts. Um, and we'll be using this a lot in the meditation. So in the meditation, we always talk about repetition. Because every, every time we generate the right thought, for example, we wish uh, uh, maybe the hair is well and happy. So that is, you're only generating one right thought. Because once you stop the right thought only, then the mind will naturally cling to other things. The mind cannot not think. <laughs> and the mind will have to think. So the mind will naturally cling to some other things. So you need to generate a right thought. So be it uh, loving kindness or thinking of impermanence. So that is a kind of right thought. So you need to keep generating every moment. So that is part of right effort. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm going to stop here. If not, it'll be too like uh, heavy. Um, no, it's nine o'clock. Yeah, okay. So half an hour of theory. Um, leave some time for Q&A. Open the floor to questions and answers. Anybody want to ask anything? Any scenario in life, life experiences, you want to share or ask questions regarding application of the uh, you know, the right speech all the way to this right livelihood. So as you can see um, from the Noble Eightfold Path perspective, if you want to behave well, Right, you really want to practice maybe a right action or right speech. You need to have the right thought and to maintain the right thought, you need right effort. Yeah, so it's all linked. You cannot say I want to practice uh, uh, right speech only, then everything else I want to talk about uh, meditation. Uh, no, it's related. If a person really practice their precepts correctly, that is a kind of meditation. You need to put effort to practice it correctly. Eh? You need effort to remove this unwholesome thought. You need effort to generate right thought. So that is uh, meditation itself. So even if we're sitting down, quiet, closing our eyes, we are also doing the same thing. Right? We are doing the same thing. Okay, so if there's no questions, then we are going to... Uh, Take a five minute break and then we'll come back for this guided session. Eh? So, we'll see you all later. Okay, anyone here has anything you want to bring up before we start the meditation? Okay, if not, uh, then we're going to begin. Yeah, we find the uh, comfortable sitting posture, make sure your back is upright and the rest of the body relax. And the uh, first thing we are doing is uh, impurities of the body meditation, learning how to detach from the body. So we are going to visualize all the hairs, hairs of the head, hairs of the body. And we are going to generate this right thought. Huh? That means to uh, wish it well and happy. Every time a new image arises, then we wish it well and happy. Every time we think of a new patch of hair, we wish it well and happy.
and every time we generate a new image that is a new condition for clinging and these are part of the five clinging aggregates so we need the right effort to uh, reduce this craving new image and new thought yeah? new image right thought new image right thought And you find your mind calming down to like this baseline emotion, quite settled. Then this is the uh, right condition to think of impermanence. Huh? Because if the mind is not calm and you rush with impermanence, then uh, basically not much effect. Left. So you need the right conditions. So now we're going to think of uh, impermanence. All these hairs go through birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. And we think of them growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. And as we keep looping this process, we can also observe the arising and passing of the five aggregates. So there's a form, feeling, perception, mental formation, consciousness. So whatever we imagine in the mind, that is a subtle form. You cannot touch it at all. Yeah, it's in the mind. So a subtle image, subtle form. made of the uh, <clears throat> even talk about feeling on elements then you observe what kind of sensation go to that thought process when you generate an image what are the sensational elements involved so that is the subtle kind of form yeah? In fact, wherever your attention move around, you require that four element sensations also. Eh? Without the four elements, you're unable to locate the location of your attention. And you observe the impermanent nature of that element, that sensations. When we think of an image, okay, then the second aggregate is the feelings. Whenever the hairs change, yeah, gets old, gets young, falls off, what kind of feelings? Are they the same? Are they changing? And the third aggregate is perception, all the past memories you have, right? What kind of colors you want to put in your hair, what kind of length, what's the size of the hair, what kind of labels you use to name the image. So all these are perceptions. Mental formations are every time you generate a new image, that is a new mental formation. And consciousness, basically, that's your attention, your awareness. Where are you paying attention now? So that is your consciousness. Huh? So you can pay attention with your eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. So when you generate an image, we are using a 
in the mind or consciousness but in between two images what happens to that consciousness where does it go does it stay there does it run around And if you're hearing my voice, you're using your ear consciousness. And then we can ask ourselves, are these hairs truly self? Can we tell the hairs not to go through this birth and death? So know that whatever we are <coughs> training is the uh, clinging or the attachment towards the hair. Yeah? In no way we are training the actual hairs itself. So the next part of the body, we're going to think of the nails, fingernails and toenails. May they be well and happy. And all these nails go through birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. So you think of them growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. And as we keep looping this image, looping this process, we can observe the arising and passing of the five aggregates.
Okay, then we can ask ourselves, are these nails truly self? Can we tell the nails not to go through birth and death? Next, we can think of the teeth, all the teeth inside the mouth. May they be well and happy. And all these teeth go through birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. So you think of the teeth growing and falling. Growing and falling, many, many cycles. And as we keep looping this process, we can observe the arising and passing of the five aggregates. Okay, then we can ask ourselves, are these teeth truly self? Can we tell the teeth not to go through birth and death? And next up, we are going to Think of the skin. We wish all the skin from head to toe well and happy.
and all this skin go through birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. So you think of them growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. <clears throat> and as we keep looping this process, we can observe the arising and passing of the five aggregates. And we can ask ourselves, are the skin truly self? Can we tell the skin not to go through this birth and death? Okay, next up we are going to uh, cultivate the four sublime states and we familiarize ourselves with the mindfulness of the four elements of the body mainly the sensation so there's no need to visualize from here onwards so basically the feeling of sensations so the four elements are the earth fire wind water elements earth represents any hard or soft sensations fire element represents any warm and cold sensations any kind of temperature wind element represents any kind of movement fast or slow and water element represents any moist or dry sensations so there's no need to deliberately create those sensations we let it appear naturally by themselves wherever they may be so our job is to generate right thought when the sensations arise, we should well and happy. New sensation arise, we should well and happy. Let it arise naturally by themselves. Doesn't matter what kind of form, yeah, what kind of elements, what kind of feeling. Sometimes it can be painful feeling, unpleasant. Sometimes it can be nice, pleasant feelings. Doesn't matter. Just make peace with them. Wish them well and happy. Do not struggle. Do not cling. So the only way to tread this uh, middle path is to keep generating this right thought. Keep the wheel rolling, then it can travel. When it stops rolling, it will uh, topple, yeah? fall to the sides, to the extremes.
Okay, the more we generate the right thought and we can observe this calming of the mind or the settling of the mind. So again, more or less, it will have the same kind of baseline emotion. In fact, any kind of meditation object, once you start generating the, this uh, loving kindness or the right thought, it will come down to a certain baseline emotion. Eh? And once we have that, we kind of take note of that state of mind, what's the emotion, mainly remember the emotion. And this is the restricted kind of loving kindness. So now we're going to cultivate a boundless loving kindness. We are going to wish all beings in all directions well and happy above below and all across but, but no need to push the mind eh? we let it expand naturally by itself so no matter how far you wish to expand let it be doesn't matter and what we need to take note is the uh, sensations. Eh? So we are going to treat all beings the non-discriminative method. They are made of the four elements and the five aggregates. So whatever sensation we detect, near or far, inside or outside the body, we wish all beings well and happy. So we do not try to restrict our loving kindness to just the people that you know. We are using this uh, boundless, noble concept. So when we detect any sensation, we wish all beings well and happy. A new sensation arise, may all beings be well and happy. A new sensation arise, may all beings be well and happy. So accompany every sensation with a right thought. Okay, and then the more we generate this uh, right thought, if the conditions are right, you put in enough of this uh, consistent effort, right thought, right mindfulness, everything, and it may activate this right concentration. So if you experience any increment of joy and happiness compared to the baseline emotion then that would indicate the first level of concentration usually loving kindness and the first level so regardless of what you experience treat them as just byproduct emphasis is on the right thought 
Keep wishing all beings well and happy. So the reason why we keep turning the wheel is that the mind will naturally cling to the extremes if we stop applying the uh, Noble Eightfold Path. If the mind starts to drift off, right, start to follow the daydream, then it's clinging to sensuality, yeah, craving for sensuality, and if we cling on to the peaceful states and it's clinging or craving for this eternalism. So to avoid these, these extremes, we need to tread the path, yeah, this middle path. Keep turning the Dhamma wheel, may all beings be well and happy. Okay, then we are now going to add some insight, some wisdom, and we are going to reflect how to cultivate a more unconditional loving kindness without attachment or clinging. So that is, uh, we are using impermanence, reflection on impermanence. So similarly, we are going to use the real-time evidence, whatever sensation appears, that's your observation, evidence, and apply the right label, the right thought. So whatever label associated with impermanence, you can use rising, falling, change, anicca, impermanence. Just pick your favorite and keep repeating. Okay, let's say the uh, joy and happiness start to disappear. One may experience a neutral 
and a refreshing kind of experience. And we call that equanimity associated with the fourth level of concentration. So in fact, there's two kinds of equanimity. One is the jhanic kind of equanimity and the uh, vipassana kind of equanimity. Yeah? So two in one. And similarly, regardless of what you experience, keep on turning the Dhamma wheel, keep reflecting on impermanence, and treat everything else as byproduct. Okay, then we move on to the next sublime state, which is compassion. So for compassion, we wish all beings may they be free from suffering. And again, we're using the non-discriminative approach. All beings, uh, whether they are rich or poor, healthy or sick, as long as they cling on to the five aggregates, that will result in suffering. So whenever we detect any sensation, any element, any of the aggregate, then we are going to wish all beings free from suffering. Can a new sensation appear, may all beings be free from suffering. A new sensation appear, may all beings be free from suffering. So the whole idea is to come back to the foundation of the elements, not to get dragged into the storytelling of the mind. So once we start to worry and plan or how to help a certain person, so that is uh, liability, eh? becomes restlessness and worry, part of the hindrance. And that is very, a kind of draining kind of compassion. So we are not doing that for now. Now we are going to recharge the compassion. So we are not going to the storytelling, no stories, no dramas. Just come back to the elements. Learn to free yourself from suffering and not to get dragged and caught up in the five aggregates. New sensation appear, may all beings be free from suffering.
similarly, if you uh, keep generating the right thought, put in the right effort, keep repeating, and you may trigger this uh, right concentration. So this compassion uh, may lead to the second level of concentration denoted by the emotion of joy and happiness. So if your compassion can feel joyful, then that would indicate the second level of concentration. Eh? That's the concentrative kind of compassion. And likewise, regardless of what you experience, keep on wishing all beings free from suffering, treat everything else as byproduct. Okay, and now we're going to add some insight, some wisdom, and we're going to reflect how to overcome this suffering. That is not to not cling on the five aggregates. So we're going to shake off this clinging with impermanence. Same thing, any sensation appearing. We uh, take note, real-time evidence. And we need to reflect using right thought, right labeling, think of impermanence. And if, let's say, the joy and happiness start to disappear, this time it won't uh, be the same experience as the equanimity from before. Uh, one may feel a kind of blankness or spaciousness. And we call this the perception of infinite space. Yeah? And regardless of what you experience, keep on reflecting on impermanence, treat everything else as byproduct, and do not get lost in space.
Okay, and we are now going to the third sublime state, which is appreciative joy. So it's uh, very closely associated with gratitude or appreciation. And we are using the non-discriminative approach, all beings, regardless of winners or losers, as long as they go through the process, they will gain a new experience. So likewise, whenever we detect any sensation, we also gain a new experience. So we are grateful, huh? we appreciate this moment-to-moment -moment experience. New sensation arise, rejoice with all beings. New sensation arise, rejoice with all beings. So the more we rejoice, then the mind should be able to settle down and normally this appreciative joy can lead one to the third level of concentration denoted by the emotion of happiness. So regardless of what you experience, keep rejoicing with all beings. Okay, now we're going to add some insight and we're going to reflect all beings will eventually be separated from what they have achieved. And so likewise, all these sensations, they don't stay with us forever, they come and go every moment. And we keep reflecting and observing in permanence.
Okay, before we end the session, due to time constraint, same gentle reminder in all activities, standing, sitting, walking, lying down, we can uh, maintain this right thought, right effort. And with that, we can gently open our eyes, formally end the session, informally still can generate right thought. <clears throat> Any uh, problems or questions? Any issues? <coughs> okay, if not, uh, then we end the session. Have this closing chant, eh? this dedication of merits. <coughs> Akasata cha pumata devanaga mahitika punyang tang anumoditwa chirang rakantu loka sasanam etavata cha amhehi sampadang punya sampadang sabi deva sabi puta sabi sata anumodantu Sapa Sapa Tisidhiya Tran uh, Dedication of Marriage to Departed Hidang Minya Tinang Ho Tu Sukita Ho Tu Nyata Yo Hidang Minya Tinang Ho Tu Sukita Ho Tu Nyata Yo Hidang Minya Tinang Ho Tu Sukita Ho Tu Nyata Yo An Aspiration Imina punya kame na ma me bala samagamo satang samagamo ho tu yavani bana patiya sadu sadu sadu. And we end off with uh, paying respects to the Buddha tree three times, three bows. First bow, second bow. Third bow. <clears throat> okay, and uh, that's all for tonight. Any announcements from Terence? Okay, if there's nothing, then good night and see you all next week. Thank you. Thank Bante. you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, good night. No problem. Okay. Good night, everyone. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night.